Good morning and welcome back to Morning Express. We are glad you're with us from Matters Sports. Let's get to current affairs. This morning in studio with me is Zambros Weda, who's a lawyer. Also Agostino Neto, he's the Ndiwa Member of Parliament. And Mombasa Senator Hassan Omar. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. You had a good weekend? Uh, extraordinary. You're so smiling. Good. You had a good morning as well. Yeah, a good day. <laughs> I mean, in this country, we continue to hope, even with uh, all the challenges that we have on a daily basis. Yeah. But the weekend was great, I think. I um, um, had a couple of activities. Uh, and then after that also, um, we finalized uh, the feedbacks which we got from the Okoa Kenya bill. So it is set to now to take a slightly more concise format, and uh, I think it should be relaunched anytime soon. Okay, Neto, your weekend was good? Fine, yes. I was in the village, a uh, couple of village meetings, uh, watching development projects and a couple of burials here and there, but I had a good in an interesting weekend. Okay, weather, church? Uh, yeah, mine was good. On uh, <laughs> Saturday, I was in uh, Sierra County here. Yeah. The Secretary General of TNA had lost his brother-in-law. We went to Bari. And also to give them the good news of uh, the Jubilee goodies. It went on very well on Sunday. What goodies? Uh, we'll get into it, as you can see. <laughs> but you see, if the the the, 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 the chairman in, of uh, now the sugar you take comes mm -hmm. from my institution. On Sunday, I was preaching in my local church, mm -hmm. and I was saying men like Agostino should be uh, praying fast before they do politics, because mm -hmm. there is politics, politics and football. When I think I don't go to church, whether I am a staunch seventh day. I said pray. I didn't say going to church. They <laughs> said pray, yes. Yes, not going to church uh, to, to politics and say Agostino is here. This time Baba is taking no praying. That's what I meant. All right, let, let's get to it and let's begin with the Lamu uh, attack that left uh, 11 Ash Shabab killed two soldiers as well. Uh, and we hear of other reports that there are other about 60 uh, uh, Shabab as, as well insurgents went to a village in a different part of Lamu and were speaking to the residents there for about three hours. And this coming at a time that the country was marking one year since the Peketoni killing. So security netto continues to be a big concern. But what's, what worries you the most with these reports on Lamu? Uh, I, I think that the government has, looks like has learned nothing since Peketoni. You know, in fact, you're wondering that you're hoping that when we were commemorating the first year of Mpeketoni, there should have been um, a more astute ways of dealing with insecurity in Kenya. But sadly enough, the same territory that has been hit for a long time has continued to, be, to witness a lot of insecurity. It just shows you that government is not so sure what to do. You know, the reason people vote in government is to protect life and property. And for Jubilee to constantly fail on the, on the security front, I really think then they do not have their house in order. I think they have no... So when you say fail in this case, what are the failures? I mean, look, one, uh, uh, I think I saw the, uh, the Inspector General say that there was an impending attack. I mean, they, what you do with intelligence is to help you counter the, the, the attacks. But if at all you still have intelligence, you do not use the intelligence to help counter the insecurity, then I really think that the, the intelligence is of no use. So yeah. I really think that, yes, you have intelligence coming in, but some people are either interested in having insecurity perpetuated for their own interests or they're not just willing to do anything about it. Where the 11 of these al-Shabaab were yes. killed, but isn't it worrying that you have about 90 of them, actually about over 100 still roaming from the other 60 that went to this other village, so that there's some place somewhere, you don't know what they're planning next. Doesn't that worry you? <coughs> yeah, uh, to the extent that they, they, they exist, but uh, we, we must look at where are we coming from. Have we made some progress? You can see that now the attacks are sporadic and, and a bit cowardly, it's not as brazen as it was last year. Uh, and, 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 and but maybe these are testing the waters to see what the, has The last time when they attacked, well, the we use history to predict also, to understand the present and predict the future. Last time they came brazenly and decimated the whole area. This time you can see the act of uh, people who are on the run. You can clearly see that they're sporadic, they're trying to show that we still exist, but they are running. And, and even this time you could see the casualties. So we can see progress being made, and you see the, 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 the Inspector General is aware, he informs the public that this is the situation where we are. We need to be careful. We need to continue liaising together. It is not uh, like what they, they, they are saying, so, so, so bad, such a big failure. Progress has been made, and it is still being made. And we call upon them now. This is the time monies are being allocated. It's parliament which is going to allocate 
200 billion for security, 300 for their salaries, 400 for <laughs> so on. So this is actually the time for them also to sacrifice and say we want more money in security, we want a cogent plan. So we have made progress. They are now out of Nairobi, they are out of Mombasa town, they are out of Migori, they are out. You can see that they are out. Progress has been, let's not be uh, naysayers at every corner to cause fear and despondency. That is what the terrorists want. Kenya to live in fear. All right, and, and that we will not do. You know, uh, I think unless we're reading a different media, they say that they try to attack a military base. Mm. That's more audacious than attacking soft civilian targets. Uh, what happens is, you remember when uh, President uh, Museveni, I think they were just trying to, you sometimes try to connect things. Uh, President Museveni said that there's a Shabab who's on the run, the same rhetoric where they're using. Uh, and based on that, he, he challenged them to, 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 to attack military targets. Why are they attacking soft targets? You recall that kind of a mm. speech by President Museveni. Mm. So my own assessment was that they were trying to match up that propaganda. You know, you have to connect some of these dots. So they were showing, they were showing their level of audacity that they can attack both soft targets and hard targets. And uh, I think what happens is uh, my condolences to the two to, to Kenya KDF soldiers, soldiers who were killed because yeah. what Weda does not want to appreciate is that fact that these men, uh, for that matter, are looking for martyrdom. They are not in a conventional war. And when they go there, they have already prepared themselves for martyrdom. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important for us to see how best we can continue uh, to, 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 to invest in strategy particularly and surveillance so that we can be able to repulse and how, how we can, what is called the, the, the trans-border trans uh, kind of uh, engagement with people in Somalia, with the international community, so that we can be able to, to forestall. And I, and, I, and I find it very simplistic to, to believe that only additional money will improve security. I, I think we have the only budget that has continued to grow exponentially. Every other budget here is, yeah, is security. security. And, uh, and therefore, it, it, uh, security must be backed by sincerity, yeah. must be backed by wit, must be backed by strategy. And I think that, for me, as, as I read from many <coughs> analysts and who are speaking to it, uh, the, the Shabab was trying to sh demonstrate its audacious nature by attacking a uh, military installation. Yeah. And Neto, we are seeing um, leaders from five counties also talking about these uh, cafes because this is one of the measures that has been put in place by the security agencies to help deal with this mess. But they are there all of the time. Now they are pleased ahead of Ramadan to have them lifted. But then again, to have curfew after curfew or rather one just being extended and revised, is that how we want to operate as a country? Uh, and uh, that shows you that there's proper lack of strategy in terms of how to deal with security. First, uh, I said earlier, the reason you vote a government is so that you enjoy the freedoms and, 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 and your rights that come with it. Uh, freedom of movement, and especially so during Ramadan, is one of those things that uh, the Muslim faith should be allowed to exercise. I mean, you know, for example, the, uh, during the Ramadan period, they uh, operate most in, in, in the night hours, 6 to about 5 in the morning. So to exercise curfew at this kind of time is a violation of their fundamental rights. And you cannot have a government that always, you know, uses curfew in perpetuity. You know, curfews should be used as, the, as Man, a last resort and for the government to constantly be using these sort of things you know you have a government that is always uh, clawing back on fundamental freedoms and I really think that it is not fair and proper if at all you have you want to sort out security there are better ways and I think the Muslim faith and the Muslim community around the coast have told the people and the government how best to deal with issues of insecurity but uh, I really think that um, we must be having a proper way out of this insecurity problem. And uh, one such thing is the government should show exactly what it wants to do clearly, as opposed to uh, interfering with the rights of the people, or the citizens who are supposed to be enjoying the rights. You know, I, I do not care. Me, I want to leave, I want to do my trade, I want to do my business. It's the reason I give you power. But, no, no, you cannot also say you do not care. For instance, you're told, you know, for example, you'll be going to park your car, you know, you park at owner's risk. Will you just park, leave the doors open because the I mean, government I mean, that, is that, supposed that, that, to That's a totally different you. thing. You know, the reason you have a government in place mm -hmm. is to ensure that, Sophie, you enjoy the rights that you, you have and the rights that you hold. I, I give you power. I give you sovereignty so that you protect me. I want to enjoy my rights. I want to go and pray at night. So the citizenry has the no responsibility? The it's not the citizenry's responsibility. It is the government's responsibility to 
to, to make sure that I live in free. Really? There's no responsibility for the citizenry at all? There are only obligations. There's no responsibility. I'm only obliged to ensure that, for example, I'm enjoying my rights. I'm not interfering with uh, Senator Omar or, or um, Bruce Weather's rights, for example. But in terms of ensuring that I enjoy my rights, I think it solely lies in government. In fact, you cannot be constantly um, clawing back on people's freedoms in the name of fighting this insecurity. If security should be sorted out out of my, the spheres of, of, of my various rights. And I think that is what we need to do. So whether these freedoms, the government is clawing on them by these curfews, you agree that there needs to be a sense of finding other ways to handle this, especially in, in places like Lamu where we've seen perpetual um, curfews? The government is not clawing on freedoms. Actually, it is uh, Muslim fundamentalists that are clawing on these freedoms. They want us to live in fear, they kill us, they do all this. The government is actually trying to enhance these freedoms. And it is sad when you hear a sitting member of parliament or the, on a, see no, no good uh, uh, path, which I think is, is, is very sad. It is our responsibility as a people, first of all, to ensure that our homeland is secure. Such that if you see, if you hear about, if you know about elements that will disrupt our lifestyle, then it is our responsibility to come up and deal with it. For now, what works is some measure of curfew for their own sake. Because this You for say for now, some of these curfews have been there for months and months and months. Well. Al Shabaab has been there for years and it is there <coughs> and the fight goes on. So if you want and, 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 and that fight requires certain sacrifices. You, you know, Sophie, you what, to what Weda is doing, which is, is really shocking, you know, so Weda speaks like a non lawyer. He knows appropriately that Article 24 of the Constitution says very well that there is a way you can derogate on people's of fundamental rights. There is how you can stop me from enjoying my rights. And, and, and he knows that you cannot, a government can then not use curfews in perpetuity for purposes of, of restoring security. And for him to just speak like, you know, it is proper and in order for governments to use, I mean, really. Well, I, I think let me, let, let, let me deal with this. Yeah. <laughs> I am a Kenyan first. Okay? Mm. A Kenyan first. A human being first then uh, other things. I, I think him is an MP first, uh, first and then uh, called the code first. The situation we are in now calls for certain serious measures in order to contain the Al-Shabaab, the Muslim fundamentalists, because they are not joking. If they walked in here today, they would deal with it. Even being sight all of us, you walk into KTN studio. But it's not an excuse for laziness in the system <coughs> because then they don't come up with other ways to deal with the problem. All they keep doing is infringing on other people's freedoms in that same argument you're using. Uh, Shouldn't we then see uh, some form of you know, steps forward being made so that we, we... I have explained a few minutes ago that if you look at where we started and where we are, we should be able to see that some progress has been made. And okay. it is being made. But if you talk about freedoms mm. and then you think that uh, being asked to say because we are in hard times these people come to kill to maim to destroy to prevent them at okay. this time there's this level of curfew then you come waving the constitution you wave it then they come and throw a, a grenade at you and by the time you, you so you're you, saying the law should be at one point or another sidelined for the security of kenyans these freedoms do not mean that you wave it even when you are going to your own death. Please, government is uh, in place to ensure that you are secure. Security right. first. These uh, people the constitutional, the constitutional doctrine, if, um, if mm -hmm. a reader re reads it, uh, reads the law and understands it, even the, the binding court of appeal decisions, mm -hmm. that uh, even a time of war, you can never set aside the Bill of Rights. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's jurisprudential. And therefore, I think what happens is, I, I do agree that uh, there are times when you need measures that all those measures must be within the confines of the Constitution. And not number two, one thing is, uh, which frustrates me about Jubilee, which is the demonstrably here, is that you know, ignorance, that because you are now, there are people who are committing crimes, then you, you validate official crimes. So now you commit crimes yourself. You know, I, I think that's the most lumpen thing you can ever hear. It's a, it's a government that is incapable of handling uh, the, the intricacies of state. They are incapable of even turning around the situation. Does and the citizen that, have a responsibility in your uh, opinion? I mean, uh, I wanted to differ with, uh, with Neto there. Rights come with responsibilities. It's a maxim that is well known, that rights have responsibilities. And those responsibilities, though, only extend to that point where your rights do not interfere with the rights of another. And that's the responsibility that you have. Mm. But, that, but that responsibility for me, after having ceded part of my rights to, to, for you to maintain my security, then you don't now continue to, 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 to tell me 
that it is for me to, to report to you every little thing. My responsibility is as a good Kenyan when I see suspicious actions, but you cannot fault it on me when, when, when insecurity happens and you tell me I'm not com committing my responsibility. All right. So if I, if I came into, I saw a suspicious looking uh, bag and I reported it to, to Katie, and uh, that's my responsibility. But if I didn't see it or I didn't report it, you can't tell me uh, that I failed in my right. responsibility. All right. Monica Juma rejected. Were you among those that voted in as far as that uh, yes. direction is concerned? If so, why? I voted uh, with the committee report in terms of uh, rejecting their approval. And um, yeah, first of all, let me explain. Of course, I know members of parliament have been bashed on, the, on that particular front. But you see, parliament works on the basis of committees. That it's in matters of vetting, in matters of, of, of um, uh, doing this sort of approvals, it is a committee that informs the direction in which parliament goes. Um, the committee of administration, fault it or not, uh, almost unanimously, the only person, there was only one dissenting voice in the name of Honorable uh, Gikaria of Nakuru East. You know, even members of court legislators who are in particular that committee voted for, for, for adoption of that particular report. So for me as a legislator, uh, there have been no official uh, court position in terms of whether to reject or not to reject. The best way was to proceed and adopt the committee report and that's what I exactly did. So I voted with the committee on this one because that is why you, you have the committee vetting and informing the House. So if at all this one... We but know you saw what they found, the recommendations in in fact, one of them, the, uh, you know, the first one was that she's competent, has vast knowledge on this particular issue. Their concern was on this particular letter and what it indeed did in as far as their engagement with our office. And yet there are other avenues of engagement. In fact, she was just trying to ensure that they uh, play by the law. So you agree with what it is they're arguing because you've read the report. You I did read the report. I yeah. mean, I'll, I'll explain to you. I, I mean, you know, everything else. You know, people uh, bash and, and applaud Parliament in equal measure. There are moments when Parliament makes mistakes. Uh, but you see, when Parliament makes mistakes, then again, you must also appreciate the circumstances in which those mistakes were made. But uh, let me just try to juxtapose two things. Uh, people talk about uh, the removal of office of the Deputy Chief Justice, Honorable Baraza. Uh, and the reasons Baraza was removed from her office was astute arrogance. I mean, she pinched someone's nose, and, and that was behavior and conduct that was not expected in those circumstances. I think what the committee was arguing in its report, and it was saying, yes, we appreciate Juma is very competent, and, but we think that um, her arrogance or her, the level in which she engages people in public ought to be turned down. So I really think that they're saying, yes, in one measure, you're really competent. But we're saying, because the office you're going to be picking up is an office in, 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 in public, and there's conduct. If at all, for example, I think the members of parliament were arguing, you, you treat us in such contempt. How much contempt are you, are you going to treat members of the public? So I really think that, in some measure, uh, the infights within Jubilee, I mean, I have seen, I've, I've seen uh, press reports to the fact that members of the Jubilee Coalition wanted to be bribed by the presidency to approve. That's the problem. In fact, for me as a court legislator, the one, one of the reasons I actually would have voted for, for the adoption of the report, anything else that m puts the Jubilee House in fire is something that I really, really encourage. So if at all, they're having fights of bribery amongst the MPs of Jubilee to approve who is nominees and they're having an infight, that is the business. But I really think that one of the things that they said, which I thought was something that was credible, and let's temper on arrogance, let's temper on how do you deal with public office, so that yes, you're competent, I am a good, I am a good uh, CS, I am a good deputy president. So what's arrogant about <coughs> just saying that, let's engage in this particular way, what's arrogant about that? Uh, I mean, I think one of the things that you, your members of the public do not know is the fact that uh, <coughs> the way the principal uh, secretary has dealt with members of parliament in their daily to day engagement. If at all, the argument was, if you're engaging with us in private in this manner, what more are you doing to members of the public? Yes, you're competent, but the level of arrogance How is How has she tempered. engaged with them in private? Um, I don't know. I mean, it's even, it was even manifest one of the letters that they were showing that, I mean, <laughs> this lady here is not, is not, is not even welcoming or, or recognizing our, our, our when, force. Uh, are these double standards, is it picking no, literally that shocked. we're seeing? I think it was uh, in their true character since it was not uh, their salary and I think Madame Juma did not have a bag of money. <laughs> these people, we look at history, I said we look at history to see where we are going. Look at the way these people dealt with the, uh, with the um, governors. One made Twanga, they have hit governors left and right because of supremacy. Look at the way they try to deal with the judiciary. To the extent that my friend Justin Muturik calls judicial orders stupid orders. It is a question of supremacy. And here, why are they hitting this lady? Because according to them, this lady did not see their MPs, their honorable members. Is she simply told them, gentlemen and ladies, this is the procedure through which we want to deal. Engage in this so that we serve people equally. They said, oh, this one will be very difficult. So what they did, I think the mistake that uh, that lady did, 
she needed to call her friend and a smaller ramp. Then she also goes there with money because I know that they, 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 they collect. I think what they did, history will judge you wrongly and wrongly. And when we meet after you leave office, when we sue you to recover the money you're earning illegally, that will be some of the issues we'll put forward. Senator, you agree with the recommendations? You know, just coming to report. You know, my brothers and sisters in the National Assembly, I need sometimes to reason through certain things. You know, one bad decision after another. The the the, the K E S C totally hogwash. You know, they will, they had no justification to send those two people packing. Uh, the issue the, because that, that 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 petition had no merit. Coming to react emotionally because the Senate told you to 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 to, to remove devolve function funds that are still in national government and put them into the in, 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 uh, and and increase the quota. You know, now you come with the Monica Juma case. The narrative is extremely, extremely uh, uh, un unconvincing on the basis of arrogance. Those are, those are people relationships. I, I myself have never uh, met Monica Juma in that official capacity. I, I have not even bothered to look for her because I, of he I hear of her rhetoric, but I, I wouldn't use that against her. I hear of her rhetoric saying about collateral damage when you talk to about rights. You know, the same rhetoric you hear from Weather. So for me, I, I, I look at it from a very, from a very you know, uh, governance point of view. So I, I wish they had an, a narrative of governance, that she was rolling back on fundamental freedoms and rights, that they, they, they would have been compelling evidence. We heard of some, some meeting with the pre between the presidency and, uh, and the leaders of the northern Kenya, and there were certain recommendations that were put forth. We, 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 the, the assumption was that somebody was not facilitating those, those recommendations being put forth until the, 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 if you can ignore an entire resolution Finally, people pushed and pushed, and now these recommendations are being are being affected. So I think I would have used a different approach, uh, even if I wanted to reject her. But the one of um, she didn't allow us in her office. She didn't realize. In fact, for me, I I, fi I find no challenge. I, in fact, whatever mistreatment or treatment I get from from uh, members it doesn't affect my judgment when it comes to, to to me sitting in court on an individual. But I think, uh, in fact, uh, you know, some of us are told are said to be arrogant. Uh, in, a, in, a circumstance, in various circumstances, you know. So arrogance is, is not, is not, a, is not there's quantifiable. No it's not a, it's a, it's a, it's a sort of quantifiable <laughs> thing. Uh, you know, I, I, have, I have people in Mombasa who say I'm down to earth. I have others who say I'm arrogant. I have people who say the people I feel extremely da very amiable, I'm told, the people say they're arrogant. People react in a different manner to different people. And I think that is a very... Uh, very, very simple. I mean, very simplistic uh, assessment of a, of a, of 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 a, of, a, of a process of this kind of nature. So then we might end up not having anybody voted. Uh, I, I think I think a couple yeah. of things. Mm. One, I agree with uh, uh, Senator Omar when he says that one uh, on the ESCC commissioners' parliament was wrong, and of course uh, my dissent was recorded on that one. On the second one, I also agree with him on issues of the budget. Uh, when 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 the National Assembly took away county budgets, that I agree with him. That was a totally uh, wrong thing. But the third thing, uh, on this Monica Juma story, I mean, look, we are charging Parliament with the vetting process. You're asking Parliament to look at the pros and the cons. The reason you're giving us these people to look at is to say, we're looking for some fundamental flaws. She is a competent person, but we're saying, you're serving in the public office. Why does everyone appear to disagree with you? There's been let uproar me, across Sophia, the board criticizing me, your decisions. Me, so why is it you're the only ones who are right? Let me, jurisprudence, you know, now from a, point, a purely point of, of what uh, I call legal, legal point of view. Yeah. They, they, do, they actually do have the bandit to vote. In fact, even if and you that's read, not in I dispute. remember when I was doing the Kiala impeachment, right. I read a lot of precedences about what parliamentary processes are. Parliamentary processes are <coughs> quasi judicial and quasi political. Mm. Which, are, which quasi political means you can, I, I, there are precedences where people have found there are actual wrongdoings by a, a <coughs> certain public official and yet not impeached. Mm. And their preference is uh, and because it is quasi-political. So you take a political decision rather than a, a quasi-judicial decision. And there are areas where they, they, I read of, of, of certain governing areas where there was no wrongdoing that was so, 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 so spot. But people felt because of the context of public office that, that he had been waned so much in terms of his energy and his authority. So quasi-politically, they felt it was important to impeach on the basis that he might not be able to, to galvanize the authority. But in of, this of case... So I, on this one, I think they used more of the quasi-political powers than the quasi-judicial powers. Quasi-judicial means you have, you, you have looked at the merits and there's really nothing. So what they then used was the p political, what is it called, uh, political um, uh, uh, persuasion. 
But that's why I'm saying when you use any discretion, my mm -hmm. brother, or for that matter, there is a public out there. They really weight your discretions and your statements on account of what I call reasonable. Or, you know, you, we all gauge it. And yeah. even people who disagree with Monica heavily told me this one was unreasonable. You have your own political party leader, Raila Odinga, even then now, because you say as a party you didn't have a position on this, also trying to draw capital from this, supporting it, saying that Jubilee have gone after their very own. Why? Because he appreciates appears at least two, in as far as how this was carried out, it was wrong. So Good. your own party I mean, leader... I mean, I mean uh, the party leader is actually right in saying that uh, Monica Juma's decision on Jubilee, Jubilee's decision now was wrong. And we're agreeing that a few members... Which is of now we know it's not just Jubilee's decision. There are court members who voted against for that. All court members. Yes, I mean, uh, that's what I'm saying. You know, um, uh, let, let's look how parties vote in this kind of things. You see, if parties were whipped, you know, or court, if court was whipped, for example, to, to vote for, for the rejection or adoption of this, then that becomes an official party position. Because, you see, um, if you look at the voting that happened in the House, there are some people who voted for adoption and also some for the rejection. In fact, it was across board, both Jubilee and court. Mm. There, no, there was no single line. The moment when you take a position as court to say that the, on this one, we are, we are voting in this particular manner. So one, because there was no official position at the time of voting, that is why the, you saw the dissent. But the two, um, in terms of moving forward, I told you, we vote on the basis of the committee. The committee has recommended, and even the members of court in that particular <laughs> committee has, have, have not seen anything f to, to merit the fact that there should be a dissent. And has there never been a time a committee report has been overturned, members have voted against its recommendations? Yes, in fact, I'm, I'm happy you, you raised this question. Let me tell you the other dissent that you watched in the floor. In fact, the reason there was an uproar, I think it's the person who then was moving the amendment. You remember when Honorable Dwali tried to move the amendment for, 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 for the changing of the report? I think that is what made things worse, because then one, uh, they were looking at uh, the executive is now running roughshod over, over the National Assembly. That is where I think we lost it, because then uh, people were thinking, you, you remember Dwali was not even That's given a chance <laughs> to move the amendment. And, 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 and when members of parliament discovered that the Member executive of might parliament, have been... You can't say you voted because <laughs> now you know that that, that, that would no, be... No, no, but, but, to, but to, to, to be honest with you, to be honest with you, you do not then want to give parliament a, a role. And then on the other side... Also the role is not is what role. is in question. It is how you exercise this role in this particular case. I mean, you, you, and that's what I said before. You people only want Parliament to vote in a way that you want. If I told you we voted in a way that you want, then it's good. If you vote in a way that you don't want, then it's not good. I mean, seriously? I, 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 I didn't want to disrupt my brother. Uh, I thought now, instead of a lot of English, you would have said, in this one, the people of Kenya, we made a mistake. We were wrong. We took wrong things into consideration, thereby ending up making a mistake. And we are willing to redeem ourselves by making a right decision. E there's a lot of English, Parliament did this, Parliament did that, this, this and that, this and that. That is not the position. The lady is competent, good, and they said the only reason why we want to reject you is that you don't see us as honorable members. And I, I have the deputy <coughs> leader of court somewhere, somewhere in Kibwezi. He has now started politicking with it, that all cambas are being finished. A very pedestrian way of looking at a serious <laughs> national issue. Please go and tell your <coughs> colleagues in the National Assembly, they made a mistake in this one, and we are expecting apology from yeah. them, whoever they are. You know, one of the only permanent, I think, principal secretaries who is extremely knowledgeable on security matters. In fact, if there's one person I don't fault, and that's why sometimes I, I, I draw such great disappointment from Monica, a former ambassador who, who actually was one of the finest we had. Ask her, ask her, Wetangula and anybody else who knows her. Ask the people who've worked with her in the civil society. She was an academic at Moore University. So her, her path ha has not been a accidental. It's a very deliberate path. Okay. She has been, in fact, well, there, was, there was a time we, 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 we had viewed her as one of those center-left uh, kind of uh, thinkers who, who really believed in government being in the middle. So I, I think that's why sometimes uh, the disappointment is when you get into government, you reveal. But I think one thing also, finally, as we move forward, uh, uh, that's where most governors also goofing. A lot of other uh, technocrats are goofing. <coughs> when you serve in a public office, especially intricate public office, it is not just your professionalism that counts. You have to have a knack of how to be able to relate with, yeah, with yeah. diverse yeah. interests so that you're able to, to, uh, to, to juggle them. And, yeah. and the master in that, if you want to learn a, lot, a bit of this uh, script, is uh, my chairman in the legal committee 
Amos Wako. I was one person who was extremely critical of Wako as AG. Right now, as my chairman of legal committee in the Senate and human rights, I could, I could take a bullet for him because I, you find, you come to appreciate that Wako knows how to mitigate against, uh, 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 in a very rough road of interest. Yeah. Have you learned uh, from him? You are extreme on the, uh, the other side of that. <laughs> All right, let's talk, let's talk <laughs> the budget, uh, Neto. Your thoughts on it in terms of whether it hit the mark, your expectations or not? Uh, a couple of things. One, I think uh, the, f the fact that we still have a crazy recurrent expend on the budget uh, as opposed to development expend, uh, that really worries me as a country, that we constantly want to expend much more than, than we can put into development. That is one thing. I really think that the next budget, and we've, we've tried to request the chair of the budget committee, that uh, the appropriations should be in a manner that can But did Parliament yeah. add some of this recurrent in the budget when it came to you? Uh, yes. I mean, yes. Uh, I mean, I'm just telling you that what we've, we've, some of the comments we've made on the budget that one, we've noticed that there is a lot of recurrent expenditure on the budget. We've, we've requested the, the chair of the committee of budget to ensure that there's a lot more development money uh, coming into, into, into the full as opposed to all this recurrent expend. But the second thing is the fact that one, um, there was uh, money being put into uh, social protection issues. Uh, the many widows, uh, many um, old people uh, and uh, orphans and vulnerable children. This social protection money has always been there, but I really think the manner in which it has been handled, uh, there's of course an increase this time around, I think with 51% of that particular, uh, that particular vote. I really think it needs to be, uh, it was piloted before, but now we need to have a um, more organized manner in terms of which this money uh, is, is, is appropriated. The third thing is, uh, on this fuel story, I really think that uh, to, to have an increased money in terms of how much people Kenyans are going to pay in, ter in terms of the fuel, I think that as a spiral, it takes away everything else that we, that we have gained because then uh, with the rise in the cost of fuel, that means the rise in the cost of almost everything else, which then now puts a dent in the Kenyan's pocket. I really think then the budget in those lines of those not then very pocket friendly. And lastly, perhaps before my colleagues talk about, is you know, Kenya is a predominant an agricultural country. We've always constantly watched money being put into um, irrigation schemes, but those irrigation schemes have not really, really lived up to the day, so that Kenya relies mostly on uh, rain-fed um, agriculture to the expense, I mean, to, to, to a level where it's, it's to our detriment. Kenyans end up starving when we should have put in more money to, to mitigate all these uh, environmental disasters in a manner that then helps us with, uh, with the rain-fed um, agriculture. And on security, of course, my colleague has already spoken to it. Uh, there was a 200 billion shillings uh, on security, but I really think that is money that is always going to waste because we do not see the dividends it, 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 it pays. So I think uh, it is a manner where the government just throws in money to make us believe that uh, security is going to be in order, but I really think it's a conduit for channeling and, and, and stealing money from the people. Why do you agree in, uh, development is not getting as much money? Because some would argue there's quite a lot that's going into uh, <coughs> We know that uh, the, the salary bill in this country is beyond the proportions of this economy. It's huge, 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 huge. And then they want to add with it uh, another um, referendum to, to, to go in. But you hear even from the member of parliament as they talk, nobody talks about raising revenue. Where is this revenue coming from? They're talking about expenditure, expenditure, expenditure. If you look at that budget, the security docket needed more money. The education budget needed more money because the biggest resource a country has is its educated workforce. Then the health docket needed more money. But because of other issues, other things that have to be contended with, little, little money here, little money there had to be put there by making it difficult for us to tackle those fundamental areas of the economy that can push us forward and the bulk of it is salary <coughs> which requires uh, that uh, Madame Sarah Zarem has been crying day in day out that we reduce it. That has not been possible. So looking at the budget in the circumstances and the collection of money we have, it is good. Any areas that the MPs are talking about, it is now your turn, the ball is now in your court to reorganize it in a way uh, before you pass legislation so that Kenya has something that has an input that will push us forward. It is not good enough that every member of parliament, when he rises up, either talks as TNA or you talk as court. Oh, this government. Oh, that government. Today okay. it is you. Mm. The, the, the legislation will come from you. Those brilliant ideas that you're having here now, go and put them in that legislation so that once it is passed, <laughs> we move forward.
You know, the last time Bilokero was here, yes. he got very irritated about the lack of uh, uh, financial prowess that we had exhibited. When he, he went on the same, in the same role, and Bilo told him, at that time, the, 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 that annual budget for the entire Parliamentary Service Commission, which included salaries, wages, allowances, maintenance, development, everything, 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 was about 20 billion, which was at that time constituted about 1%. Which right now against a, against a, a, a whatever a budget of 2.1 trillion, the, the PSC the PSC budget is still at about 20 billion, which is for everything, for in terms of uh, so that still constitutes one percent of 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 uh, the, the the country's you know overall budget. So when weather creates a perception that that one percent is what is is denying us uh, development, I remember Bilo telling him here in this very show. Let's stop this, uh, you know, very, very uncritical assessment of uh, the budget. But the budget, you remember, once we had uh, Bilo here, and therefore I think he, when he talks of, of, as if ev the MPs have consumed everything, uh, it is they are talking about one percent going to an arm of government. There are three arms of government: the judiciary, which received uh, about uh, how many billions? About eighteen or seventeen. Uh, Sixteen billion. Yeah. Sixteen billion. Sixteen billion. <coughs> Uh, per PSC, which received about, uh, which is the parliament in its entirety, which received about 20 billion, and then the rest was uh, monies that was, uh, was uh, minus, the minus the monies going to the counties that the remainder thereof was for the national government. So I think be, let's be factual in the things that we talk about. So to this is less than 2% so of the annual uh, budget. But then so secondly, on, in terms of the budget, I think, uh, I think uh, on my own assessment, I'll be very sincere, I think the budget appeared fairly fair in terms of uh, uh, its prioritization. But again, I want to see a more progressive people's budget, you know, as in, uh, as in it's taking care of our basic needs, our ba uh, the, uh, dignifying the lives of the Kenyan people. We're yet to have a pro-people, pro human, uh, human, human, what do you call it, human interest or human-centered budget, human being, so that we are able to, to talk about our uh, expanding avenues to, 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 to certain uh, 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 avenues of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, okay. of of, of, our, of our basic needs. Uh, but th thirdly, the thing I, I, I picked out very conspicuously is the growth of, of the allocations to the NYS. You know, everybody is raising a lot of concern about this NYS. The NIS itself has, w has warned about this be uh, mutating into a paramilitary institution. I think the budget policy statement put NYS budget at about, is it three or four billion? <laughs> that rate rose almost substantially by three, four times uh, in terms of the uh, ev ev eventual allocations. Okay. These things are, are things that we, we need to flag out very sincerely. Briefly. Uh, what I was talking about in terms of uh, salary is not uh, uh, the salary of the MPs. I know the guilty are afraid. I was talking about the salary. The guilty are not afraid. Budget. The guilty have. The guilty, please, Mr. The guilty uh, have sir. facts that you don't have. I was you know, talking you about talk like the a non <laughs> I'm also an economist, that's the advantage. Where do you get the Now we are talking from? about Little. the thirty six percent that we are spending on salaries in the budget. Of which one percent not, is please, MPs. not the extra that you are taking against the law. Okay. So th that's why we say if as a ca even yeah, you, you know, if you take your own in income and almost half of it you are spending on recurrent expenditure mm. and you are not investing, then there's a problem. That's what I was talking about. So Senate has, yeah. Yeah. Senate has, yeah. Senate has been recalled. Let's, let's move this along. Uh, today you, you're having a sitting. Yeah, but I'll be unfortunately one. leaving for a year. Because you see, let, let's face it. Uh, are they going to explore ways to hit back? I'll just ask. No, no, I think what, what we want to do is to explore. Parliament. What, what happens is people thought they needed to, 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 to make an assessment as to how best to, some, you know, sometimes, if it were not talking about the issue only, of uh, of uh, of uh, of uh, of uh, of uh, the the one billion oversight fund, you know, whether it's petty, I'm telling you, this guy Please has tried all his Senator, life Senator. to be elected. He has been rejected Just four or five times. <laughs> this guy will never be elected. I'm telling you, you know, you know, even the people of Kisumu, they are very w are very wise. They look at you in this Senator, media the and they know you are an unelectable human question. being. But that said and done, uh, you know what happens. So I'm saying, what we're, what we are doing is to explore. The, the fact that they have punished institutions across the board. You know, the SRC has been punished uh, for because and uh, part of its budget has been cut off. Uh, judiciary. The judiciary has been punished. Uh, the Senate does, does not regard it as a punishment because this oversight fund, as far as we are concerned, we, we, it is money we never had. So when somebody denies you something you never had, you lost nothing. That's the, that's the, that's the bottom line. Right. So we are looking at it in the event uh, for future proceedings. When the Senate argues 
that uh, we want to see certain monies allocated to devolution, and this is where these monies need to come from. Mm. We are saying in future budgets, if uh, Neto and his team, for instance, not Neto, but uh, Musimi and his team, mm. act in a such an arbitrary manner, then go back and start punishing institutions they disagree with. So then what, where does that put the mandate of the Senate? That is one thing that we, I think is the and, actual discussion. Yeah. And Neto, you notice the choice of words by the Senate are punished, uh, vindictive. These are the kind of words that describe you and your colleagues. Surely you cannot continue to say that all you guys are doing is following the law and there's nothing off uh, with the manner in which you go about see it. See on this one, uh, you remember we, s we agreed that uh, the National Assembly was wrong because uh, you know when you go on a mediated text, I mean, you know, the constitution anticipates a manner where we, there'll be disagreements on both houses. But once you have a mediation team that agrees on how to proceed, I really think then you, you must stick bound by the mediation uh, committee agreements, not to then look for who else to punish. I think on this one, uh, the National Assembly was, was wrong and agree, ag acted arbitrarily. And I mean, you remember sitting here last week with the Honorable Senator Elachi, she said uh, the, the chair of the budget committee made mistakes there. And, and those are things that you cannot, you cannot then attribute all those mistakes to the National Assembly because um, the budget committee chair himself made those mistakes, and those mistakes must then be ascribed to the particular holder of that office. All right. Where the, the yes. president last week lashed out at um, Senti cabinet secretaries at an event at uh, Strathmore University, yes. and uh, he even went ahead to allude that they're very fast in cutting deals, but when it comes to important national issues, and then that is not the case. And later I emerged that the CSs who are not there, like Aidan uh, Mohammed, was said to have been unwell. Um, for Kandia out of the country, for Rutich, the budget was coming up. For Kameni, uh, it's unclear. But uh, what are your thoughts on the First president? First of all, the Russia? budget that was coming up for Rutich, even, uh, you know, minister for in charge of planning, Anwar Guru, there's a matter of taking, uh, putting priorities, talking to young Kenyans, uh, showing the opportunities required these people. It's a matter of one hour. You are there, you finish your talk, you give confidence to the people of Kenya. And that's what the president was saying, that if some Wazungus were coming, they would have long prepared. If but Rotet said he'd given his apologies. So now for the president to come and his own people he like to start to saying, go. he said he had given he apologies can only that his perhaps apology never to got. To the, the, the boss, and his boss is the president. Take it on a light touch. I don't think the president... Uh, light uh, touch when he's talking about deals? <coughs> he knows something that we don't. He's in charge of the country, received the NSIS and so on. But uh, take it on a light touch and uh, appreciate that what they did actually was wrong, especially such an important function. I don't know whether they feel, because the other lady, Madame Anwar Guru, seems to be working very hard. I realize that he made even the court leader, Raila Odinga, to hold an Arambi in Kibera after he went and decimated bad things and made Kibera shine, then I think Raela also saw and said, let me organize some Kaharambi. So I think maybe that was um, uh, avoiding that function. Maybe the ladies are shining, all of them, and they are not happy. Being absent was wrong. They should have been Even there. That was a great unwell. forum. Uh, unwell, yes, we understand. But what about others? Anwar Guru was also preparing the budget. Uh, Rotich. Uh, Kaimen. Surely one hour, and they, they could have hired choppers to jump there quickly. One hour, they talk to the people of Kenya. These are the actually the, the core we are dealing with. It's a university. Okay. Senator, I'm surprised that uh, we are now saying because we've gone to Kuchimba Mitaro, Kidogo, and Kibera. Now he's saying Kibera is shining. But anyway, uh, I think it's a good start, uh, nonetheless. But that's it. So you're done. saying there's what? Uh, yeah, you know what I'm saying that uh, no impact and why has made I'm saying Kibera. That it's a good start. Okay. You, you saw my my my, my rider. But I think, uh, you know, when uh, you start saying Kibera is shining, it's still the biggest slum in, in, in the south of Sir. And in, there are those in, who in argue Africa. the party leader went there because they're feeling that their inroads being made that they no, want but, to but counter. Uh, but the truth is uh, that, that Arambe was organized by Kidero. Those of us who, who and Kidero invited party leader. Party leader, uh, we, we, we thought, that, you know, this is his governor. Why not, why not go? Uh, you've, you've realized Raila is not in the strategies of uh, organizing Harambe. Uh, so I think that's said and done. Um, the president? Uh, um, I think, uh, you know, when I, Uhuru doesn't surprise me anymore, the statements he makes, you know, Mpeketoni was uh, the work of uh, foreign, uh, of uh, local networks, uh, you know, he makes the statements like, uh, you know, calls the British, uh, other tourists, uh, taxi drivers, so I think of Uhuru off the cuff sometimes is, is unguarded in terms of his remarks. I think, and if you know today, if Cholet walked here, he walks into a meeting and said, Oh my God, Sophia and everybody else is not here. These guys uh, don't, don't come. <laughs> yeah, I will, you know, you have to realize that there is something drastically wrong 
you know, there was a time people rush to presidential functions, notwithstanding how busy or how sick you are, you'll take a tablet to keep you awake for, for, for a few hours. So I think that there's a general lack of interest uh, in, 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 in even this. Look at, look at, look at, look at, uh, look at Uhuru when he used to come to the coast region and all that, or he's going to inspect projects. He used to, just used to send us these cards for SGR and every people would, wow, you know? Uh, lately, you see it, you click the delete button. You know, like, I mean, no, this is a, a fairly a waste of time. And I think also the ministers are doing the same thing. When you see, take, I can tell you for a fact, that you, I, I saw that analysis in the standard yesterday by, by Jacob Ngatich. I think there is a question of who really is in control. And even if you are wronged as a, as a, as a, as a president, my own assessment is that you should have gone and made such a firm rebuke internally and said, in future, I want to see everybody here. OK, now they'll start coming because of, you know, you don't want to be named and shamed all the time. I think okay. that's become Uhuru's strategy of producing lists Neto. of every kinds of people. <laughs> I, I think uh, Uhuru's comments, the President Uhuru's comments just shows you that uh, things are falling apart in his cabinet. His center cannot hold. He's no longer in charge. And, and that is good admission. I mean, uh, when the I president is not in charge, I mean, it's supposed to be collective responsibility of cabinet. So he's been left to make the decisions alone, some decisions he does not understand. I really think it pays the price. And uh, Kenyans really know what they're dealing with right now. But having said that, I think uh, where there should not be constantly obsessed with the prime minister doing the events and stuff like that. I mean, I really think that uh, the prime minister is a leader, should be left to do what he wants to do in the, in, in the meantime. And the fact that uh, Jubilee in, and, and TNA is, is channeling a lot of money to make a paramilitary thing in the name of NYS, that is also being questioned. And I really think uh, stick to your course, stick to your guards, let God do whatever they have to do, and you do whatever we are going to do, and let Kenyans evaluate us with the kind of comments the president is making. I'm sure you're sure where Kenyans are going to send you. Uh, and Neto, I want to throw this at you still. ODM restructuring party structures uh, ahead of 2017, and your party has had a number of blots in the recent past and as far as how it conducts its affairs. So what is this uh, geared to exactly? I think the party is one uh, notice that it needs to restructure, and uh, one they're looking at uh, the various... What wasn't working? Why, why restructure? Um, one, uh, the, the, new move, the new new formation is going to bring into county uh, governance as part of this party structure. We're going to have a national national structure and a county governance structure. So what you're actually having is you're having counties as, as a unit of the, of the party. So you have a un unit of the party that is going to start all the way from the polling center, which has not yet been there initially. Mm -hmm. So you're going to be having pol polling center committees uh, all the way to a county, where the county is going to operate on its own, having um, a county chair and a county neck that makes decisions. And then after that, you also have a little, a little committee in the National Executive Committee, which is composed of the chair, the Secretary General, that also helps in making quick decisions in terms of how that party is going to work. So I really think it's a restructuring that is useful so that uh, you do not have uh, regions where, for example, you do not have uh, a lot of ODM support because of the number of delegates ending up at the National Delegates Conference. So, so the restructuring is useful in terms of it's going to make sure that various counties are in charge of their various welfare and, and activities. I think it's a good thing. Okay. Wada, yeah. SA quotes Baz Bashir from leaving the country. Today, judge is expected to issue ruling. <laughs> Your thoughts on that so debacle? Some judges are postured. I think some judges, uh, they come from the, the, the holes and then they think they own the world. When you come to international issues, first, a court cannot issue orders it cannot enforce. Standard practice basic legal learning in any average university in any part of the world. So that order, first of all, you should have known, can we enforce it? That is number one. Why Second, can't it enforce? Why I can't enforce it? Yeah. Because it's illegal, <laughs> first of all. South Africa does not have uh, a treaty over the ICC and so on. That's one. Number but two, the president. It's not. It's not. Yeah, number yeah, one. Number yeah, two, yeah. Uh, there is presidential immunity. Okay? Number three, that. Uh, but that was uh, unsuccessful. That warrant. We still saw Uhuru go even despite the resolution of the African Union. Yeah? We still saw President Uhuru Kenyatta go to the ICC before his case was terminated despite the African uh, Union resolution. So in terms of immunity, that doesn't fly still. I want you to get it in this sense that when a head of state goes to South Africa, when he goes to the South Africa as a country, the, is, he has immunity there. Okay? unless that country has an obligation, a uh, complementary obligation with the ICC, which, which South, Africa, does. South Africa doesn't. Okay. Number two, the summons that uh, I was talking about have been retired. 
by the ICC. They retired it because they postured around the whole world and then they realized we need a newer strategy. Third, fourthly, issuing that warrant or, or trying to, to restrain had deep, uh, immense negative repercussions for South Africa as a country. Sophia. They would not pay that price. Sophia, 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 Sophia let, let's, let, can let's, let's say something. So Sophia, it is you know, not about before, thing, just wait, thing, Sophia, before, thing, uh, before Mary speaks. One at a time. Before Mary speaks. Mm -hmm. yes. Sophia, you should never let Weda speak those things he's spoken on national TV, especially on principle of international law. I mean, look, this is, this is a gentleman who needs uh, thorough education. One, mm. there is a principle of the law of treaties, which is called Pangrasun Severanda, that parties are obliged with, the, with this, the contracts that they sign with the international treaty. So first, South Africa is under obligation to implement uh, the uh, ICC treaty obligations. You understand? That one, ICC does not have a standby police. The only person it relies on is state parties. Kenya, South Africa, Nigeria, any state party to the ICC can enforce the warrants on behalf of ICC. Whether to reason like this, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 it is, it is strange. And I really one thing, one thing, one thing I, 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 uh, uh, Neto, my brother, you have to be as patient when you're in this show on Monday morning. Uh, but that said and done, I can tell you for a fact, South Africa is one of the first state parties to the international crimes. In fact, part of the international crimes uh, uh, statute, uh, Rome Statute of the ICC, was mm -hmm. born out of partly the lobbying by South Africa. So uh, therefore, for, for Weda to come today and tell us that South Africa is not a party. So in fact, what happened was an application sent from, uh, from the ICC presiding judge of the trial chambers asking South Africa to honor its obligation. Mm. Then the, the matter was, was presented before the courts. There was an inter-party argument, if you saw, and then the, an order was given that Bashir should not, be, should not, should not leave uh, South Africa before that, that matter is dispensed. So, so what the judge is going to look at is some of those areas, whether, yes, they, they have uh, jurisdiction, whether they can stop Bashir, but I think what happens, the International Crimes Act, or, or, or the, the, what domesticated it, removes immunity on crimes against humanity, at least in South Africa, across the board. Mm. It, it, it provides nobody with immunity on crimes against humanity. So I think what happens is, uh, where does, you know, where, where, where the weddling over these issues in a manner that I think uh, he, he does not, he does not understand. I mean, I mean, well, he is yeah. uh, extremely, you know, you know, when, when I Let, when Let's I not make it about Weda, no, Let, no, let's keep to the issue. No, Weda is misleading a public on pure ignorance. He, all he needed to do was to be on the social media yesterday to look to see the, what was going on. He needed to see the application by the yeah. by the by the judge, which is uh, then uh, then it was not just an order that came from out of the blue. Then the the, the, the order was presented before a, a judge, a high court judge mm -hmm. in South Africa. Mm -hmm. The high court judge then decided, yes, let me hear it into parties. The order is not a warrant of arrest against Bashir. He doesn't even get it. He, it's just a, a stay right. from Where Bashir's departure. You, 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 want you see now, Omar, I, I think their heart would have been. You look at it, mm -hmm. South Africa as a nation as an interest. It is like as Obama comes here, then we are unhappy with something, then we say, Bwana Obama, <laughs> before you leave, you cannot leave until this issue filed by whether, whether you have built a Simba or not, is determined. The country has to look at it. That's what South Africa, first of all, looked at and said, eh, gentlemen, we cannot bring this unto ourselves. That's how he, le he, he left. Second, the warrants we are talking about had been retired. Ben Suda retired them. So there were no warrants even to arrest him. So what these people are talking about, they want a political solution uh, uh, guised as a legal matter, and then so they think a country which is so as progressive so as South Africa Sophia, would meddle in the way they meddle me here with the week, No. Allow me on Monday to give Weda the request from the ICC dated 13th requesting that Bashir be arrested. Sneaky yeah. request. <laughs> 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 All right, let's, my, let's, my let's move this uh, along. Uh, uh, then second, let's, let's uh, uh, I, yes, please uh, come Sophia, with all I those think, copies. I think we will begin I want the to session. Agree with you know, a lot of time I've been very patient <laughs> here on this show, but I think I want to agree with Neto. I think some of these things that, that the way that we that put, say, puts across must be take, put to, to strict proof. There are young Kenyans who are watching us. There and that's why you're here, us. which you've already done. So that's I will bring you the letters. I will bring you the orders. At least you, uh, you are able to, 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 to let us from the trial court <laughs> or trial, pre trial well, What do you make of the proceedings with so, the so, deputy so president's so case and what the OTP is arguing and, uh, and asking the court to do to allow for statements that were issued by witnesses who have since recanted or are diseased to still be used now in court? Uh, you know, constantly I do not want to engage with the Kenyan ICC cases uh, before. Uh, but uh, look, 
because we, we, the witnesses uh, uh, before the trial were gave comments and uh, make, made insertions that they wanted to go and uh, testify. But those witnesses have then since been either coerced, bought off, and things like that. I mean, that you cannot allow. In fact, part of the things that Kenya should have been done for during the SEC status conference, which happened sometime last year, the Kenya should have been castigated for letting witnesses be interfered with and then coerced into, into removing and counting the witnesses. If at all, for example, the, the, the president said... Whose role the is it, uh, witness protection? Is it Kenya or is it the court? Uh, both sides. Both sides. Both sides. Have both sides. I mean, okay. Kenya has an obligation to ensure that witnesses are protected and also not coerced into, into, into living, and also the court also has a mandate. But you see, one of the things that you cannot allow is that the, the, the Attorney General's office is supposed to have been helping uh, the, the, the process of ensuring that witnesses are protected, and this did not happen. And, and for, for them now to try to coerce witnesses in terms of recanting their cases, I really think it's something that is unfair, and it's, it's also going to be helping uh, defeat the process of justice. Okay. I think um, that application by the OTP should be allowed, so that the cases are looked at whether they have merited, meritocracy or not. And I really think that we're not saying anyone is guilty, but we're saying let the full course of justice... What if those people were lying? That's why they recanted, so still I mean, go the, ahead the, the, There is a way... That's perjury. A, the, the, that's perjury, and there's, way, there's a way to deal with it within the meaning of the SEC statute. All right. if, if at all we find that I made, I made uh, statements out of, uh, out of malice, out of, I was coerced, there's a way the court is going to deal with it. So, so bring them on. If at all they made mistakes, if they're paid to make those kind of comments, let them be dealt with in the court process as opposed to... All right. uh, Briefly, whether those who are NGO manufactured witnesses <laughs> on statement, they were procured, and when they realized uh, cross examination is very hot there, uh, they, 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 they couldn't go. Today, the law requires that you must be given a chance to cross examine any witness that speaks adversely against you. To come up with with procured statements against on the Bruto, I think that would be heinous crime against Bruto, and. Uh, we hear that uh, the, the NGOs around that time procured these things. It would be wrong. And I, th I think Ben Suda should just own up and say, in this one, I've hit a wall. May the Lord uh, bless those who, do, who are still alive. All right, we uh, have me, three minutes to go. But, uh, but, uh, but uh, well, Sophia, the procured witnesses huh, then also must face perjury kind of proceedings because I think they lied before under oath to a court, to a competent authority. So I think what is happening, even the ICC itself acknowledges, there has never been a, a such unprecedented interference of witnesses like in the Kenyan situation, one mm -hmm. and two. And therefore what I, what I think Ben Suda is trying to do is to try and exhaust the ends of justice so that these cases can at least uh, come to its logical conclusions. And, I, and, I, and I'm, I'm hoping that it will be allowed in this regard that if that the testimony that they provided was false, then they need also to be prosecuted for giving false testimony and putting the Deputy President supposedly under that kind of uh, pain. So I think it is whichever way these witnesses must be brought to justice. All right, let's end on a healthcare uh, note. And um, I don't know if you managed to watch the story on KTN, the Bungoma uh, referral hospital uh, and the neglect there. I want your comments on that because bodies next to patients, they've been there for 48 hours. Uh, but also in line with that, uh, Munya Peter, the governor, now the chair uh, mm. of the Council of Governors, last week said they're extending an olive branch to the government. They will all now, as governors, sign to the medical equipment services uh, project. Uh, uh, however, this is also happening when they are still in court seeking a uh, temporary injunction to have the whole rollout uh, put on hold. So on one hand, one wonders what has changed because they still have all of these issues where they feel that uh, the government overstepped their mandate with first, you know, inviting tenders before having an agreement signed uh, between the national government and county governments. I'll begin with you, um, Member of Parliament. Uh, first, I think in terms of the tendering process of uh, equipment, I think there's a funny thing going on there. Uh, one, uh, healthcare is a mandate of uh, the county governments, and whatever county governments do with their monies is supposed to be left with the county governments. That's why they're autonomous. Bungoma uh, County needs to run healthcare in the manner that they understand, based on national policy. Homabe County needs to run healthcare in the manner they want. But for government to um, hire equipment for them, which equipment <coughs> I'm sure the cost, I mean, members of the health committee inform us as much, that the cost of hiring the equipment is twice or three times the cost of buying the initial equipment. So I really think someone is going to benefit from the deal. In fact, we, we did vote at some point to, to reject 
the hiring of this particular equipment because we think uh, that, that the deal is some, someone wants to make big money on this but one. it's not just equipment isn't it coming with installation with maintenance with training so to just say equipment hiring mm -hmm. it's not just equipment. Uh, I, I really think that one that should have been left on a county to county you see counties have needs I mean and I'm happy you you just you violated the case of Bungoma Bungoma knows what it's pressing for them in terms of the healthcare needs so you have an overarching national national policy in terms of how to proceed with health care but the, 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 the individual the individual county basis ought to to be left with uh, with the county governors to, 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 to decide and so for you to to run roughshod with them on the equipment equipment they may not be needing I mean they, they could be need but I really think that the agency the reason why you, be, you you let the governments have a chance to make decisions they know what they need most they might be needing a mortuary they might be needing more personnel as opposed to equipment you see how to realize rights to health right to education is you know as a county what we need now in the immediate what do we need in the next two or three years and this is what I think we need to be giving the governors latitude to, to, to for example but isn't the equipment being procured just basic or rather being leased basic equipment that doesn't matter which part of the country you are it's uh, not a but the county governments are going to be paying for it over time so it's you, you we are leasing for you equipment equipment you might not be needing in the immediate and you're going to be paying for it on the, in the next couple of years i really think it's unfair and i really think for governor Munich how are they paying for it isn't it the national government so there's a 90 million shilling remittance to the national government every year okay mm, that's what they have been protesting all right uh weather Oh, anyway, uh, I, I'm very sorry about what is in uh, Bungoma. One of the, in this constitution, one of the things that I think we sh ought not to have done was to devolve health care. And then the governors themselves have gotten it. What they want to see is money. Whatever they say, where is the money? Even when equipment have been hired, even the police, the vehicles have been hired to the police. Maintenance goes to the owner and, uh, and all these things and training. Look at what my governor in Machakos has done. He took the equipment, done a good job. Part of the problem in Bungoma and some of these other countries is mismanagement by the governors themselves. They should know where the problem is. Just basic cleaning, basic towels, just keeping a place clean, surely. That does not need God himself or the president. So they should know where the mistake is they should correct that one so that we have just the issues of equipment and issues of drugs but basic beds cleaning they are busy with the tenders in the streets stealing here and there but the actual work okay they should go for training at uh, <laughs> one, thing, one, Final thing, word. Uh, one thing um, that is very appalling for what we saw about uh, Bungoma. Bungoma County mm. but there are a lot of I've been doing county visits we've gone to various counties Mars mm. a bit uh, El Marquette, uh, a host of other counties, and I can tell you unanimously, uh, a lot of these counties are also doing very well in terms of healthcare. Things that they have never seen since independence are starting to, be, to manifest right now because mm. it's the biggest devolved function, and many bo may now monies are getting there somewhat. Uh, health centers are, are looking a little a lot better. We were just in Turkana over the weekend uh, on Friday. It was extraordinary in terms of what what is going on, uh, and I think Wajir people say give uh, similar stories. So I think uh, I think um, this one was uh, is, uh, is uh, it I think I think it, it reflects on the incompetence not of the governors but of the of the pu 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 of that person in charge of that particular county NECC, and then on the on the equipment deal, it's unacceptable totally. Mm. I think what happens is what why one of the reasons why they are signing the MOU. It's because you know you have the, some of these uh, 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 Machakos types who have been signing. They are one after another being put, being put under pressure. So what happens is. But uh, they've now all the, come yeah, out now and said they all sign. Yeah, what they decided is let's just go forward. Then we now this, this, now we start to argue the, the intricacies of the various. Then uh, why go forward with something that's wrong? No, no, if it's you an really MOU. It is not a uh, it's not a contract. An MOU for those equipments at least to to, go, to get there. But in terms of the dynamics, in terms of who's paying. Who is going to do what? Who's going to do what? They are, to, they are, to, they are to totally going to reject that. that, that so we're, we're about bringing the equipment, you know, the propaganda being used right now by national government is that they are rejecting equipment that we are giving them for free. So they are taking them, and then they will come and install them. It's like you are saying, uh, Sophia is refusing to take this new stuff. So we are, we are taking it, and then but the, but now in terms of the contract contractual details. That is where now we are going to be able to negotiate who is paying what. Because the undertaking is that they want them to undertake to pay 90 million every year. 
that is now the cost that is going to go to maintenance, training, servicing of, 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 the, of the debt and stuff like that. So, and I think it's, in my assessment, it was purely un, uh, unconstitutional for, for them to purport to undertake that such large-scale procurement without involving the stakeholders, and that oh, is a devolved function. Uh, we, well, the matter is going to be coming up in court for direction on the 1st of July. We'll see what the judge will have Absolutely. to say. Thank you, gentlemen. That is the way it is. Uh, as of um, eight, uh, so twelve. Eight twelve. <laughs> eight twelve. Uh, just by my watch. Eight twelve by your watch. Mm. Thank you very much, Hassan Omar Mombasa, Senator, uh, as well as the Wiper Secretary General Agostino Neto, and the Member of Parliament Ambrose Weda, who's a lawyer. We thank you for being with us today. And stay with Morning Express because when we return, Michael Gitonga will be taking away for our lifestyle segment today on your inspiration. You'll meet a lady who was raped by her guardian who later on became her sugar daddy. What is that story about? What happened? How is she doing now? Find out in the next few minutes.